Happy New Year and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Tara Lane and I'm an Executive Coordinator for Can Do Multiple Sclerosis. Thank you for acting on, on the belief that you are more than your MS by attending tonight's webinar. The title is Support for the Partner presented by David, Dr. David Rintel, Psychologist. Can Do Multiple Sclerosis is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people living with MS and their support partners. We empower people to move beyond their MS by giving them the knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors, actively co-manage their disease, and live their best lives. Please visit Can Do MS at www.mscando.org, where you can register for upcoming webinars and view archived webinars, check out our, Star, our Can Do MS lifestyle empowerment programs, including our flagship four-day program of the Can Do program, Take Charge program, Jumpstart, and Jumpstart in Motion programs. You can also share your Can Do promises on our website and learn more ways that you can contribute or get involved with Can Do MS. Before we get started, we'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules. Questions and comments will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We will answer as many questions as time allows. You can post your question by typing in the chat feature located on the left of your computer screen. To submit a question, type in the small box that says chat with presenters. You can listen to the live webinar through your computer speakers rather than calling in to the phone number. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on Can Do MS's website. All of our webinars are archived on the website and you can view them again at any time. You can also view the webinar schedule and register for upcoming webinars. Those of you who are attending live tonight will receive an email with copies of tonight's PowerPoint presentation. And please also complete the evaluation at the end of the webinar. We value everybody's feedback. We have a fantastic speaker this evening. For the webinar, Dr. David Rintel is a psychologist who has worked with people with MS and their families for over 25 years. He is on staff of the Partners MS Center at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, the Partners Pediatric MS Center at Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston, and the MS Clinic of Metro West Medical Center, Farmingham, Massachusetts. He is a clinical instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and is also on the faculty of the Brandeis University Genetic Counseling Program. Before we get started this evening, we would like to take a poll to learn a little bit more about who's on our webinar this evening. I've just put up a poll, and we're just going to ask that you please participate so we can learn more about you. So it looks like we have quite a few people living with MS, about 65%, and um, many support partners as well. So thank you for participating. We're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation, and I'd like to introduce Dr. David Rintel. Please go ahead and take, take over. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, tuning into this webinar. Uh, I'm really honored that I was asked by CanDo to do the webinar and that you're taking your time out uh, to uh, join in. So um, let's get started. Um, I think that you heard about my professional life in terms of introductions. I wish I could hear more about the rest of your lives. I know that we have a combination of people who are living with MS and support partners who are also living with MS in their uh, family member. Um, <clears throat> but I want to point out that in addition to being a professional working with people with MS, I'm also a family member myself. That is uh, my dad on the left, actually. It was my dad. He's passed away a few years ago. and. Uh, I show this picture not because I don't think a professional who uh, has experience working with families living with MS can't be helpful. Certainly they can. But it certainly gives a different perspective to live with MS as a family member and to help care for uh, someone. And um, I was very active helping to support and care for my father. So I know the caregiver's or care support partner's perspective from the uh, from direct experience, not just from learning from others or from books. So who are the experts in caring in caring for the givers, which is the title of uh, this program? Who are the experts in providing care? So I would like to say, well, you know, I know something, but I want to recognize what you know. 
that uh, you've all been living the life of uh, uh, living, loving, coping, surviving, uh, and li uh, doing as well as possible uh, with and despite MS. So on the left, I just wanted to point out that might be you. or um, And on the right is a group. And when I facilitate a, <clears throat> uh, a support group for support partners of people with MS, it's been meeting for about 14 years. And when I was designing this program, I asked the group to, to tell me, well, what do you think I really need to talk about? So the, uh, the content of the program is definitely informed by the Framingham Caregivers Group, uh, and especially the next few slides. So what do we need as support partners and caregivers? So this is just a, a small sampling of what we need, but certainly the more information about MS and uh, medical aspects of MS and what to expect with MS, the better. That That's not only for MS patients, but also support partners, really important. Financial resources and information about how to make finances work. Because uh, living with MS puts a pretty big financial strain on pretty almost every family. And then help figuring out Practical things like uh, getting help in the house, dealing with insurance companies, equipment that might be helpful, medical stuff that we never encountered until MS came into our lives. <clears throat> There's also the question of, well, how do we get what we need? So here are just some of the things that we need as support partners. We need help and support from our family and our friends. We're going to talk more about all of these subjects, and I hope that you will come away with it. With, uh, come away from the webinar uh, with answers to these questions. But we do need help and support from family and friends. This is not anything that one person or even one family can do on our own. We need a little time for ourselves, and that's sometimes very hard to get. We need to be able to arrange for enjoyable time with the person that we're helping to care for and support, that our relationship not be completely defined by caring or by caregiving. We need emotional support from someone who can really listen to us deeply. So that means going beyond, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, today is a tough day. Well, sorry to hear that, and you know I've had a tough day too, but really taking the time to listen seriously. And connection with other uh, support partners and caregivers, because they're really, I'm sure you've already noticed that other folks whose lives are not affected by MS and who are not helping to care for someone living with a chronic illness, Probably those people don't really get what the lives of a caregiver are like, <clears throat> but other caregivers and support partners get it in a very different way. So I'd like to begin with talking about the pitfalls and fatal errors. Fatal, I think, being a bit overdramatic, but hoping to catch your interest. Uh, involved in uh, helping to support a person with MS or another chronic illness. You'll notice this symbol with the guy and the uh, crocodiles, I think I can highlight it here, will appear on the slides that are talking about pitfalls and fatal errors. So what I'm going to be talking about now are depression, isolation, unresolved anger, anonymity, and burnout. So it's important to talk about depression because depression is very, very disabling and uh, it's also very treatable. So we know that depression uh, is much more common in people with MS than the general public, but it's also much more common in caregiving spouses than uh, spouses who are not caregivers. So uh, in MS, we might say that uh, there's a biological component to this depression, but in uh, support partners and caregivers and caregiving family members, uh, it's likely a, a reaction to the challenges and difficulties of life that are created by living with a chronic illness. Now, it's also important that depression reduces our ability to effectively use our own resources and strengths, and it reduces our ability to connect with others. So it's if you find that in, the, I'm going to talk a little bit more about depression, that if you find that you think you might be depressed, it's important to try to get treatment for it. The depression is very treatable, and you'll, you'll find that you'll be able to use the resources much more effectively. You may also note that uh, a person with whom you live may have some of these symptoms, and 
you may want to uh, help direct them, guide them, or drag them to a healthcare professional who can help address their depression. So the symptoms, the main symptoms of depression include, uh, I think we all know, low mood, feeling down, uh, feeling blue. Uh, I'm going to skip the second one for a second. Uh, another marker of depression is having less interest in things. A, a third is to uh, do, when you do the activities that are ordinarily enjoyable, to not really be able to derive enjoyment from that. that there's a term for that, it's called anhedonia. Uh, change in appetite, sometimes a person gets a bigger appetite, sometimes loses appetite. Sometimes you see either a weight gain or a weight loss. Depression affects sleeping. So a person who's depressed might have trouble sleeping or sleep way more than usual. And uh, depression causes fatigue. So there's an overlap with symptoms of MS. But when, you're de when a person is depressed, they often feel like they just don't have get up and go and might feel hopeless or worthless. Um, now, I want to get back to irritability. Every other symptom is something that is inside and doesn't necessarily show on the outside. But irritability is one of the ways that depression does show on the outside. So when people, when we're depressed, we, we get pretty grouchy. And if you're living with someone who's irritable or you feel like your, your level of irritability is really increased, that might be a marker for depression. Now, depression is very treatable, as I said, and we treat it in a number of ways. There are medications called, medications called antidepressants. And uh, you, you know, I feel like I don't even need to educate people about antidepressants anymore because they're advertised so frequently. But most people tolerate that kind of medication uh, very uh, easily. But if someone is uh, depressed enough to need an antidepressant, then they should also be receiving counseling. We call it the gold standard of treatment of depression is the combination of antidepressants and counseling. There are other non-medication uh, things that we can do to decrease depression or improve it. One is exercise. Exercise has been shown by research to be an antidepressant, as, has, as is helping others. So um, you would think a, a support partner would just have so, many, uh, so much helping others that they would never be depressed. But helping others is a great way to, um, uh, to combat depression and uh, sometimes recognizing one's own help provided to the, their family member with MS, or it might actually be remembering to uh, keep in contact with others who need some help or support, and just connecting with others. So if there are support groups in your area, or even connecting in any other way by taking a class, by talking on the phone, uh, connecting with others, or we call that social support, is a great way to uh, reduce depression. The next pitfall is isolation. And isolation really is kind of the fatal error because uh, research shows that the more isolated a person is, the more likely they are to die. Now, this is a program for support partners, and you know, support partners almost by definition are, in, are really in touch with at least one person. But you know, we know that uh, couples and families can become isolated together, and particularly if the needs created by MS really suck out a lot of energy for other kinds of socializing, uh, individuals and families can be isolated together. So if you feel like you've lost touch with your family and friends, uh, I would say it would promote your health and your well-being and quality of life to uh, reestablish contact with them or to find ways of uh, contacting other people that, you, that you'd like to be in touch with. The next pitfall is unresolved anger. Now, the, we, we have unresolved anger. You know, there's a lot of anger that's provoked by living with chronic illness. Uh, sometimes the person with MS or sometimes the, the uh, care partner might say, well, why me? Why did this happen to me? And that's a completely reasonable question. I actually think that we all ask ourselves that when something happens that is different than what we expect and what we plan. Now, I have on the slide find an answer, even though there is no one answer about why did this happen to me or to my family or to my loved one. But I think uh, searching for answers can be really important and useful. Now, other people will provide answers that you might find 
uh, unhelpful. You know, uh, there's a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People by Rabbi Harold Kushner, and he had a son with a terrible illness, and he reports on <clears throat> um, the unhelpful comments received from friends and neighbors, like, well, you, your son became ill because you're strong and you can handle it. And then Rabbi Kushner then said, well, I wish I wasn't strong because then my son wouldn't have been ill. But I think that uh, going to uh, our own spirituality or just our belief system to find a way to answer the why me question is important. We might be angry at our partner, our parent, our child. Sometimes we're really angry at the person who is living with MS, where we might hear she may be angry at us. Uh, things are not going the way we want it. Uh, and uh, there is no one way to address that, but we should at least acknowledge that that occurs. Certainly anger at family members who don't help. And this comes up a lot in, my, in the caregivers group about uh, the family of the person with MS who's kind of really uh, abandoned uh, the person with MS and their family when sometimes very small amount of help can really be useful. So what can we do with unresolved anger? Like those, the picture of those fingers uh, with the frowns, when we're carrying around a lot of anger, it reduces our overall health and our quality of life, and we land up being more irritable, and you, we land up having outbursts of anger when it doesn't even always seem appropriate. So there's no one, uh, one answer for anger, but one thing that we can do is to find forgiveness. And it may seem silly to forgive people for not being good family members or friends or forgive a family member for getting MS or for not getting MS, but uh, there's a quote from the South African uh, uh, novelist Alan Payton, when a deep injury is done us, we never recover until we forgive. Remember, it's we never recover, that we don't recover from an injury until we find forgiveness. And I use Nelson Mandela as an example. You know, he was imprisoned by the apartheid government in South Africa, and you would think he would have been so full of anger when he was finally released after so many years in prison. But he found a way to, uh, for, towards reconciliation and didn't, wasn't governed by the anger in his life. So the next pitfall is anonymity. And this comes directly from the Framingham Caregivers Group and a quote from one of the members. I don't know if I'm married or I'm single. I never go anywhere with my husband anymore. I don't fit in among married couples, and I don't consider myself to be single. Uh, this very lovely person, her husband, also a lovely person, but doesn't like to leave the house, feels more comfortable at home. So she lands up doing many things on her own and uh, just doesn't, doesn't know where she fits. And uh, she finds, well, many people find that on the outside, not very many friends, family members, just the general public understand what it's like to be a provider of care. Uh, it's very common. Let's say you're the wife of a man named Sam with MS, and you're at the supermarket buying some food, and someone says, well, how is Sam doing? Which is good that they're interested in Sam, but why doesn't anyone ask how I am? Because if you live with someone with MS, you, you're living with the consequences of the illness uh, just as much as the person who has the physical symptoms. Maybe in, in a different way, but your life has certainly been affected by it. <clears throat> and how, as caregivers and support partners, can we make ourselves known and what our lives are like? Because it seems that it would help for people to understand what this life is like. The next and maybe the most important obstacle is burnout. And, you know, burnout means that we're kind of over the top and beyond our limits. What are signs of burnout? Feeling tired all the time, needing prescription medication to relax or to sleep, except for occasionally, physical symptoms like backaches or a cold or a rash that doesn't go away, using alcohol more than one than we used to do be beforehand, some more signs. Um, oops, sorry about that. Feeling more impatient and irritable with a person for whom you're caring. Feeling all the time on edge, as I mentioned, irritability, and having difficulty focusing. We all have limits. So just like this uh, donkey, if too much is 
put on our shoulders, sometimes we really go beyond our limits. And we have to watch for that. And although it sometimes seems like there isn't much to do about it, we need to find ways of doing something to prevent burnout. Burnout really uh, has such a huge impact on our ability to provide the kind of care that we want and to be the person that we want, not only with the, the family member for whom we're helping to care, but for, for everyone in our lives. <clears throat> so um, how do we avoid burnout? And I think the first, first guidance in avoiding burnout is to get some help with the caring. And I, I put on the slide, work on getting help with the caring, and that's not a uh, that's not just a word on there with no meaning. It does actually take some work to get help with caring. It often takes work to get help with the caring. <clears throat> so when we ask for help from someone else, how we ask is really important. And I'm, we're going to see a video clip from, uh, from Curb Your Enthusiasm, a show on HBO uh, with Larry David. Um, uh, and uh, it addresses this issue about asking for help. And people often say, is there anything I can do without, and we just have to know that they're clueless. And it's our job, some of the work in getting caring is to learn how to ask for it effectively by giving specifics like what, when, where, how, et cetera. So let's watch the uh, video. And we're going to see the video twice. The first time, just enjoy it because it's kind of funny. And the second time, uh, and Tara, if you could just give me some, a chance to make comments in between uh, the first and the second showing, I'd, I'd like to point out how help is requested. So here comes the video. Hey, how's your sister, by the way? Bam Bam? Yeah. Thanks for asking. She's doing a lot better. Really? Yeah, I'm really glad we took her out of that mental institution. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, if there's anything I can do, you let me know. You know what? There is something you can do. What? Huh? Yeah. You can come over today at 1 o'clock and visit with her. Visit her? Yeah. What, are you kidding? Why, you didn't mean it? Of course not. Why did you say it then? You know, it was something, an empty gesture. It was something to say. Guess what? You said it. Be there at 1 o'clock. So, um, I... I like this video, and if you want to show it to some friends, if you just Google um, or go to Google videos and do Larry David empty gesture, I think you'll be able to find it. Uh, you know, I think it talks about how people offer this general offer for help, and, uh, uh, and but it's hard to know if they are making a genuine offer. But I'd like to watch the video again. and. Uh, Larry's friend, Funkhauser, makes a really good specific uh, request for help. So pay attention when we see the video the second time for how Funkhauser asks Larry for help and the specifics that he gives. If you would be so kind as to play the video again. Hey, how's your sister, by the way? Bam Bam? Yeah. Thanks for asking. She's doing a lot better. Really? Yeah, I'm really glad we took her out of that mental institution. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, if there's anything I can do, you let me know. You know what? There is something you can do. What? Yeah. You can come over today at 1 o'clock and visit with her. Visit her? Yeah. What, are you kidding? Why, you didn't mean it? Of course not. Why did you say it then? You know, it was some, an empty gesture. It was something to say. Guess what? You said it. Be there at 1 o'clock. So, um, you know, you notice that he says, you know, be there at 1 o'clock. He might have said, stay for an hour. Um, and Funkhauser was prepared for when Larry said, is there anything I can do? He had, he had a request prepared. So I'd like to ask you as in the form of homework. Uh, and this could be equally true for uh, support partners and for people with MS, that if a friend or a family member says, well, if you need any help, let me know, or if there's anything I can do, have something ready, write it on an index card, put it on your refrigerator, and think of one thing that you would say that you think would really be helpful to you that doesn't take too long, 
it isn't, you know, too difficult to ask, you know, you don't, uh, so you might not say, well, I'd like you to drive me across country, but you could say if you could come over for an hour and help with this task or what would be really good if you would take Joe out for lunch, that would be great. Or, you know, it's really hard for us to pick up the cleaning at the cleaners because it's too far from our house. Whatever it is, think of one specific thing and just do the, make the ask. I think you will actually find that most people are much better than Larry David. And if they're given something specific to do, that they will do it. Um, we have to recognize that most people are really clueless, don't know what it's like living with MS, and don't know what to offer. So they're basically saying, well, let me know. And I, I'll say that I often find myself saying to people, you know, I'd like to help you. If I can, I don't know what kind of help you need. And I, and it, I mentioned the empty gesture on, the, on Larry David because I want to communicate that this is a sincere offer of help and not just meant to say, well, if there's anything I can do. So last, um, the pitfall is, you know, how do we avoid burnout? And a main way to avoid burnout is to learn about caring for oneself. So I'd like to talk about that for a moment. Uh, I don't really mean to have this. Um, let's see if I can erase my, my guy up here. No, he's not erasable. Uh, what, what you do to take care of yourself will be personal to you. So if your idea of lying down and having someone put cucumbers over your eyes is not your idea of taking care of yourself, that's fine. Find the, way, the ways to do it. Now, you all may be familiar with this picture. We find it on airplanes. And I often, I often feel like, well, I get in the airplane, and I realize I'm in a tin can. I'm about to be hurled through the air. And I'm thinking, gee, do I really want to stay on this tin can? And then I hear the, the, the sound of the door sealing, and I know now I really can't get out. And as I'm getting more and more anxious, a voice comes over the loudspeaker and says, if we hit turbulence, oxygen masks may fall from the ceiling. And of course, this makes me all the more anxious. But you know what they say after they discuss the oxygen masks falling from the ceiling? They say, put your own mask on first before helping someone else. And um, I was mentioning to the folks at Can Do that I love to get refrigerator magnets for these pictures because I think this is such an important concept and principle is that we cannot help others, other people, if we don't take care of ourselves first. And I recently found out that on an airplane, if you don't put your own mask on first, you really can't help other people because without the oxygen mask, you may not be conscious to help other people. But again, think about that, that if you're having trouble taking care of yourself, you won't be any good to care for others unless you're caring for yourself in a way that means something to you. Now, social support is an important way to care for yourself, and uh, part of caring for yourself is to is contact with other people who will be supportive. I don't mean contact with telemarketers when they're calling to sell you something. I mean family, friends, the MS caregiver community, the MS community in general, support groups, uh, a knitting group, uh, old friends, et cetera, and support from professionals can also be helpful. Uh, the, the job of a support partner can be really uh, difficult and frustrating, and sometimes counseling can be helpful. <clears throat> uh, another really, really important way to take care of yourself is to address your own health care needs. So many support partners sacrifice their own health care. They go to doctor's appointments a lot, but they're all appointments for the person for whom they're caring, and they're not um, they're not appointments for their own health care, and that is just so important. And let me say homework assignment number two, if you haven't seen your primary care doctor uh, at least within a year, please do make an appointment, and if something is bothering you, get it checked out. And if you have trouble because you don't want to leave the person for whom you're supporting on his, on his own or on her own, then that is something that you can ask the next person who says, is there anything I could do? Your answer would be yes. I actually need to go to the doctor, and I'm looking for someone just to pass the time with this, the person in my family that I help care for because I don't feel comfortable uh, leaving him or her on her own, and I need to be able to really pay attention at the doctor's office. 
Uh, caring for the self involves getting enough rest and eating carefully. So getting enough rest uh, includes getting enough sleep, uh, a really big issue. So we just have a video of an example of someone uh, who's struggling to get enough sleep. Just uh, to see, we load the video, please. So now we're talking about uh, other ways to care for the giver. So, you know, I mentioned uh, spirituality as a way to address the why me question. And research shows that people who utilize their spiritual connection actually um, are, are less depressed and generally have a higher quality of life and uh, spirituality and religious participation can really provide support, uh, spiritual support for, uh, for anyone who's caring for someone with MS. So I'm, I see that my next slide on spirituality is over here. Uh, so I'll just skip back to the other one. So you don't have to be a religious person to have spirituality, and you don't have to be a member of any organized religion or church or um, organized religion. You may find your connection to spirituality through enjoying nature, through helping other people. Um, I will say that uh, churches and synagogues and mosques are great ways to both explore one's spirituality to get and to get support from other people because uh, churches and religious organizations tend to be uh, highly socially supportive environments. Uh, anyone who attends any kind of service regularly will tell you that, well, gee, if they don't come to a service or to an event that someone might call and say, well, gee, I noticed you weren't there, what's going on? Uh, and religious organizations can be very, provide a lot of help and support to members who are dealing with illness. Now, you may just want to explore the wisdom of many faith traditions. You don't really need to, uh, uh, you don't need to choose one. And I would try to find a place that's comfortable if you're interested in doing it. If comfortable may mean that you just enjoy the music or enjoy the service. So let's just go back to addressing financial concerns. It's crucially important uh, for support partners to carefully address financial problems because I think the weight of financial problems, uh, uh, we feel that weight on our shoulders all of the time through worry. Uh, so some of the ways to address financial problems is to connect with other families who are also, also has a chronically ill member. Uh, there is no greater resource than other families who have dealt with similar problems, who know of programs that might be helpful, uh, ways of getting funding for services or home modifications, et cetera. And I would strongly recommend getting professional financial advice to help to manage the uh, financial uh, challenges of helping to care for someone with MS. I'm skipping this one because we saw it. Now, this is really important in dealing, you know, I mentioned that support partners land up going to a lot of medical appointments, uh, but they're often not seen and heard during those medical appointments because they're not technically the patient, and uh, sometimes it's because of HIPAA requirements, or sometimes it's because of how a healthcare provider may practice, but uh, often, the support partner or family members are invisible during health care appointments. Uh, one reason why this is crucially important is because the decisions made during medical appointments, particularly with a neurologist, will not only affect the person with MS, the patient, but will affect you, the family member. 
So for example, if your family member says, no, I don't want to do disease-modifying treatment, I don't like to take shots, I don't believe in medicine, I don't, I'm worried about the side effects, et cetera, the consequences of that decision are going to be borne by uh, both the person with MS and you. So uh, you should really have a say. This is not an individual issue or an individual decision. This is a decision that will affect you as well. So if someone who says, I don't want to get treatment, you'll say, well, you know, that may mean that you have increased disability and that you're going to need more help from me. So let's sit down and talk about this. And good healthcare providers will uh, include family members and explain the consequences of every treatment decision, uh, what may be the consequences down the road. For, in addition, visits with neurologists in particular tend to be fairly short and they don't happen very frequently. So sometimes you go into the visit and leave and realize that your main questions haven't been answered. So preparing for the visit is very important. And uh, together with the person with MS, write down the questions and then put them in a list of priority. So which are the questions that are most crucial to be uh, responded to? And if you realize that if you may have eight questions and you may not get all eight answered, which are the ones that you need answers for today? I'd also recommend bringing a list of current medications, the dose and the time of day taken. Have that printed out and just hand it right over so you don't have to spend too much time uh, gathering data and then say, okay, here are our main questions. I'd also say sometimes you have to be, um, you have to be a pretty strong advocate and say, you know, we have come with five questions and it's really important that we get answers to these five. So state the goals of your visit very loud and clear at the outset of your appointment. So again, you go in and the a healthcare provider starts to take a history and you may have to interrupt and say, doctor or nurse practitioner, we are here because we are having some big problems with X and that is what we need to address today. We want to go out of here with a plan to address this symptom or problem. I'd also strongly encourage someone to take notes. It may not be you because you may need to be the advocate, so it may need to be a third person. Maybe you'll use a tape recorder uh, or just say, you know, this is my sister Sue and she's just going to be a, a, my human recorder, in other words, a, tape, uh, a, a note taker. So many times we leave appointments with medical personnel and we realize we didn't really understand everything that was said. Uh, someone would say, well, of course, you know, it's blah, 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 and we we don't want to seem like we don't know what we're talking about, so we agree. And then later on we think, huh, I, you know, I don't really know what that meant. So communicating with physicians is really important. Uh, and most physicians have a preferred way of communication, and it's really important to find out what's the best way to communicate. So uh, it may be just a phone call, and some physicians will be good about answering calls every day. Some physicians like email. Sometimes a fax is a good way to get attention because it'll always be printed out and put in the inbox of the physician. And since a lot of lab reports come in through fax, uh, it's a good way to do it. Sometimes it's best to communicate through an assistant or a nurse or a medical assistant in the office saying, can you please make sure to let Dr. Jones know what's going on? Owl that is a bit of foolishness from Harry Potter. I'll read the um, caption on this uh, cartoon in case the print is too small for you. A guy's going to see his physician and the doctor says, you're feeling great? That's unusual. We better run some tests. Now, another way to care for yourself is to pay attention to relationships. And let's talk a little bit more about that. So first, let's talk about your relationship with the person for whom you're caring. Uh, so many times when you're helping to support a person with a chronic illness, such as MS, uh, that life becomes dealing with MS, and MS becomes kind of so big that there isn't room for much else. And it's really important to create some times and ways to enjoy spending time with each other that are not connected to MS or medical care. So some people like to create MS-free zones. In other words, let's go out to lunch and not talk about anything having to do with MS, medicines, treatment, doctors, 
uh, assistive devices, but let's remember to talk about what's in the news or a movie that we'd like to see, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, then there's the issue of, well, how do we uh, improve our relationship when the person that, with whom we're living is driving us a little bit crazy? So um, what we most often do is uh, make a general statement like, can you please be nicer? Or why do you have to be so grouchy or mean to me, et cetera? And uh, it's very difficult to know, for the person who hears that, to know what to do because uh, we don't really know what, when we're grouchy or we don't know when we're mean or we're not, when we're not nice enough. So I'm going to talk more about using specific behavioral language, how to translate complaints into action requests. And lastly, let me just say while it's here, is uh, one of the ways to uh, grow and improve a relationship is to have some time apart. And often support partners don't have much time apart from the person from whom they're caring. So again, it may be very difficult to arrange this if you feel like you can't relax while uh, leaving a person um, for whom you're caring alone, then you might want to get some way to have coverage for that. But to spend some time on your own, whether it be on your, by yourself, just alone time, or uh, going to lunch or doing something with a friend, but not that your relationship is not uh, does not subsume every other aspect of life. So I mentioned translating complaints into action requests. So let me use again the example of uh, you saying to your partner, well, gee, I wish you could be nice. Well, I don't, when my wife says, can you be nice? I'd say, sure, you know, I'm nice all the time. I really don't know what she's talking about. But um, she might want to, um, say that I should do something differently, what means nice to her. And maybe to her, nice means could I please take the garbage out in time for the garbage men and women to collect it. So um, uh, if so, w she might just say, well, you're a lazy bum, David, because you don't always take the garbage out. But she would probably do better by saying, uh, honey, I would really be happy if you would take the garbage out and, and I would not have to um, not have to remind you all the time. And again, just like with Larry David and his friend, be very specific about what you would like your partner or a family member to do, to do differently, when it should be done, how often, how long it should last, et cetera. So let me, let's try to translate some complaints into action requests. So the complaint might be, you just don't get it. Well, what, how do we, how do we give a clue to our family member what would be helpful. So the request might be, please sit down and listen to me for five minutes and don't interrupt. So I need to really explain to you what this is like for me. Another complaint is, you never do anything to help. A request would sound like, I know it's hard for you, honey, but can you please help clean up after dinner one night each week? I know that you're very tired, but even if you can just bring your plate over to the counter would be a great help to me. You don't even care about me, is the complaint. The request is, please show me some affection. Put your hand in mine at least once every day. So I hope you see the point that um, making specific requests for specific behavioral change uh, enables your family member to get a better grasp of what would make a difference. Another way to impact behavior. So. Um, Again, I'm just going to use my um, use the garbage, uh, taking out the garbage. I wish that wasn't such a great example for husbands. But um, nagging and criticism aren't generally effective. So my wife saying to me, David, you're just so lazy. You don't ever take out the garbage, or you're just a lazy bum. Uh, so a good strategy might be to wait, and when I do take out the garbage, for her to really tell me that she really likes it when I do that. So my example here is if you want your partner to, to increase their physical contact with you, instead of nagging them to do it, you could just wait until it happens and say, well, it really is so great when you put my hand in yours last night. If you're interested in these strategies, they're, they're part of um, uh, something called solution-focused brief therapy. And uh, I think my email comes up at the end, and feel free to send me an email if you'd like references to that. 
Uh, now, in addition to your relationship with the person for whom you're helping to support and care, as I mentioned, it's really important to uh, continue and actually to grow your relationships in the MS-free zone. In other words, the people who are not directly related with MS outside of MS support groups, outside of the MS society and can do because, again, life should not be completely subsumed by multiple sclerosis. So we can do that by reconnecting with friends on the telephone, checking in, find out what's going on, find how their day is, the phone, email, text. There are a lot of ways of connecting with people now. Facebook, people often are using that to reconnect with friends with whom they've lost touch. Clubs are good, you know, um, taking an hour out during the week to attend a club that you enjoy, whether it's a service-oriented club or a, a club for people who enjoy uh, a particular hobby. Uh, you find that when you go to those meetings or classes, similarly, you find people with, who are like-minded, who are interested. Organizations, which may be political or um, service organizations or civic organizations, are, again, it enables uh, a, a support partner to take part in life in general. So and I mentioned religious organizations. Um, in the MS zone, as I mentioned before, it, if you can locate a, a, a caregiver's group, whether it be for MS or um, for uh, general caregivers, it can be really helpful. So I'm getting close to the time that we want to have a conversation, so I'm just gonna go through the slides a little bit more quickly. We're close to the end, but uh, I, I just want to give ourselves some time for questions and answers. Uh, another concept is to create Sabbath, which is really just means to take a break. Uh, there are a lot of ways of doing it. it can, you don't have to leave your house to do it by keeping a journal or doing exercise or uh, asking for a visitor to come and to do something uh, spiritual sometime during the week. Uh, respite is something really important. We all need a break. Remember the uh, donkey or ass in the air who's overburdened by the amount on their shoulders in the cart. So respite means that you have some time away and the person, your loved one, is cared for either by someone taking a turn in your home, sometimes it can be arranged somewhere else in the home of a friend or in a nursing facility depending on the needs of the person. But it's so important to have some respite, to have time, maybe to visit a, a relative, an adult child, a, a niece or nephew who's beloved. Uh, it's uh, important to have that kind of fullness in life. And respite is just one of the best ways to avoid burnout and take care of yourself. These are some general strategies. Find things that work. If they work, do them more. If they don't work, try something new. Um, there are some very good resources for uh, caregivers. Uh, the one that I like best is the one listed first, The Comfort of Home, is a book uh, specific for MS caregivers uh, by Meyer and Dare, and there are a number of online organizations that are directed towards support partners and caregivers. So remember, making connections uh, are just so important. Um, I'm interested in hearing not only your questions and comments, but you may say what has worked for you in the past and giving some feedback uh, to the to can do about how this webinar worked for you, what was missing, what should have been stressed, what maybe was uh, was not um, addressed correctly. Uh, I think you'll get a copy of the slides and in the in the copy you'll see my email, but my email is drintel at partners.org. If you want further information or you want to give me some direct feedback or to tell me never to do a webinar or do again, that's your opportunity. So here's time for questions or comments. Thank you, Dr. Rentel. We really appreciate um, that entire presentation. It was fantastic. And we did have some great questions come through, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the first question is, when the care partner has MS, meaning um, this person has MS, uh, their spouse was the caregiver, but now that they've had some things going on, the person with MS is now the caregiver for them. How to best cope? Well, you know, that kind of situation really uh, gives us pause because we all think that a, a caregiver or a support partner is, you know, an Arnold Schwarzenegger muscle man who's able to do everything. And I think what's really more true is uh, the caregiver or support partner may have MS or may 
be getting on in age or may just have other kinds of health concerns for themselves. So I don't think there's one correct answer here. I would say much of what I've said about taking care of yourself is so important for both members of a family like that. Uh, otherwise, and additionally, looking for support from other people in your social support network uh, is important. And I would start before thinking like who could we ask for help is like what kind of help and support would really make the biggest difference? And maybe uh, write down a few kinds of activities or types of help that can be provided by another person, a person without maybe the knowledge of uh, the needs of each of you or without the experience, but still can be helpful. And work out a list uh, between the two of you before asking for help from someone else. I mean, this is a point, this is a suggestion that could work for, for other people as well, but uh, it goes along with being prepared for when that offer is made, is there anything I can do? But in this case, I would say, you know, what are the priorities and what are the maybe the top three or five ways that someone could help? And then next to the list, let's say I put that on the left side of the paper and on the right, see if you could think of some people that might be, that you might ask for that kind of help and support. Uh, it's also important for both people in that relationship to get really good health care and to uh, have resources. So if you're already not connected to the National MS Society, to can do or to other organizations, it uh, would be very helpful to get connected and become known and to know what the resources are, resources are in your uh, community. But that is a very challenging set of circumstances. Great. Thank you. Um, another question that came through, and we have had great questions, so thank you all of you for sending those in. Um, second question is, how to deal with a caregiver's abuse or neglect of the person diagnosed with MS? Oh, boy, that is uh, a tough question, and um, uh, I'm thinking now that that deserves to be put into a presentation like this because uh, uh, this does happen. And so let me separate that set of circumstances into two categories, although maybe that isn't fair, but uh, sometimes, uh, actually, let me combine them. I want to say that sometimes it's extremely difficult to care for someone else with a chronic illness like MS. And where, uh, whereas a, uh, a family member may be able to hold it together in general, the frustrations of life become overbearing and they end up taking out some of those frustrations on the person with MS. And I think it's important, it's easy to judge someone uh, for being brutal or for being mean or for being violent, but I would say let's start by understanding that they really may be the, like that donkey in the air where they're feeling overwhelmed. They may be working full time at a difficult job and then coming home and dealing with some very difficult caregiving issues. Uh, I think it's really important to, to start from a point of view of compassion and to say we know that it's difficult. But next, I think situations like that definitely need professional help. Uh, I know in Massachusetts there's a law that requires professionals to report if a person with a disability is being abused or neglected. And I, I don't know what's true in other states, but if you are aware of this, I would reach out I, I think the MS Society would be a good place to call because they would be aware of what the policies are. And again, this is a situation which is most likely one in that it's not calling for punishment, but it's calling for increased services and increased help and some respite for the person who's really uh, sort of gotten their frustration out of control. Uh, I wish I could offer more specifics, but uh, I would say don't wait to ask for help and to find out what help is available in those circumstances. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, um, how to encourage support partners to seek out or be open to becoming better educated who are currently reluctant? Well, that's a really good question. And um, not everybody is a, uh, is a, um, a joiner into or would go to meetings, to a can-do program, to uh, informational meetings. Uh, and you think, well, why not? Because it would really be helpful. And uh, sometimes the, what we wish for most is for the uh, family members to really understand MS better because they would understand us better. 
Uh, it also, as I said, I think my first, one of my first slides says, the more you know about MS, the more equipped you are to be a support partner. Uh, so I would say um, it, that's pretty hard because if a person doesn't feel like it's their cup of tea, it's pretty hard to convince them. So I would put it, I would frame the request in a different way. Uh, in other words, saying that you would like to really attend something and you really hate the idea of going on your own. Would you please just go for me? And you don't have to listen, but maybe, you know, just be there as a support for me. Or um, in other words, not, it, it, it doesn't have to be a command like you must go to this because you need to be educated. It would be okay to say, yeah, I know it's not for you, but it would be helpful to me or do you mind? If you do this for me, I'll see what I can do for you. I'll, you know, um, paint your nails or whatever it is that you like me to do for you. Uh, uh, and often, once a person, um, once a person sees that it's not just awful, they may change their mind about attending educational programs or webinars or something else. I often say that a lot of people, if you tell them to go see a psychologist, they'll say, what, are you kidding? I don't know, crazy. But if they meet a psychologist and they, the psychologist talks like a normal human being, well, they might want to talk to them. You know, So uh, getting, finding any way to get your support partner or caregiver to attend something with you uh, is just a way for them to see, well, this isn't as weird as they thought it was. And they may find that it's useful. Be prepared, however, that still may not be their cup of tea and may not want to attend. And in that right. case, I would find some alternate ways of finding education through printed materials or otherwise. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, another question that we have is um, actually from a person with MS. Their perspective is, um, what can we do to make things easier on our partners and to also help reduce their stress? That is a wonderful question. I would say number one, Ask that question to your support partner. Ask it in the morning and say, what can I do today that would make your life a little bit better? Now, it may seem like, well, you get a big answer, like, well, if you didn't have MS, that would really be helpful. So, you know, or, gee, if you can do all of the laundry that's piled up, or could you please paint the exterior of the house? You know, we're not going to get there. So I think it's really, is there something I could do? And you might have to say, I, you know, I think I have like a half hour of energy, but I'm really, I'm going to, I'd like to devote my half hour of good energy to doing something that's helpful to you. And, uh, you know, give some parameters so uh, the answer becomes more reasonable and kind of scale to what you're able to do. But I would say the, uh, it's a great question, and the answer is, uh, only specific to the person with whom you're living or that is helping to care and support you. So ask them. And it may take a number of times before, you, before the person gets over the shock of being asked a question like that, because very few of us get asked, what can someone do to make our lives easier? But I think that's a good question to ask just anyone that you love and care about sometimes to say, well, what is it that will make your life easier? I have this amount of time and this energy. I'd like to do it. Excellent. Um, and another great question that we have is, uh, do you have any suggestions for uh, helping to convince MS patient to take better care of themselves? Uh, maybe they're in denial, maybe they're afraid of the medic medications that are out there, um, but how, how someone with MS can uh, be encouraged to take better care of themselves and start treatment or start to accept their diagnosis? All right. I'm going to give two different uh, suggestions, and of course, these are not the only possibilities. Number one is the, a person, a family member of yours with MS is kind of an investment. We invest in each other. We invest in relationship, in people with whom we're in relationships. And if that person falls apart, we're going to be in bad shape. It's kind of like a, another kind of investment, like a house. If, you, if you, your house has a leaky roof, it's going to deteriorate if you don't fix it. So you have an investment in that person, and their choices about treatment and care for themselves are going to have a huge impact on you. It means that you're now living in a house with a leaky roof, and all of the wood in your house is going to start to um, deteriorate. So I think saying, listen, this is not just about you. It's about both of us. If you can't do it for you, do it for the rest of the family, because otherwise we're going to have to pick up the pieces. And I know that sounds kind of uh, harsh, but I'm sorry to tell you that it's true that if a person doesn't want to take care of themselves and do treatment, then you will end up, their families will end up picking up the pieces or having increased 
uh, difficulty or burden of helping to care for that person. Another strategy, which is more gentle and uh, caring, is remember the slide of catch them doing it right. So I would say every time your loved one does something that uh, suggests that they're looking after themselves, so whether it be they're taking their medication on time or if they're taking vitamin D to, when they take vitamin D or even just uh, uh, saying, you know, I'm going to skip the chocolate cake tonight, whatever it is, let them know how much you like that. In other words, catch the person doing it right, doing it the way you like, and heap some praise on them. You don't have to explain that this is a strategy to get them to do it more. They don't have to think about it. They will do it more. We're, we're human beings. We're not that different than um, any other uh, organism. Is when we're rewarded, we will do what we're rewarded for more, more often. So you can do both strategies by one is saying it's not just you, it's all of us, and the other is when a person does do a health-promoting activity, tell them that you love them, give them a piece of chocolate or a raisin, you know, make sure they know how happy you are that they're doing this. Great. Thank you. And we have time for one more question, then we're going to close. And, and if I did not get to your question, it's not that we didn't think it's important. We just had so many great questions that we're going to try to do our best to get through them. But our final question is, how do I help my partner understand that sometimes um, – I'm sorry, we're going to go to a different one. How can you find the psychological support needed by the MS patient and their caretakers? Oh, boy. Well, um, of course it depends on where you live, but I, I think that uh, mental health professionals who are knowledgeable about MS are, are too few and far between. But there are people who have an interest or who may have experienced with families living with another kind of chronic illness or illness. I know that the National MS Society uh, maintains a referral network, so if you call the 800 number for the MS Society, um, they will uh, be able to give you the names of professionals who have self-identified as knowledgeable for MS, and that's a good place to start. The next place is to ask the neurologist who's providing the care for your MS, because they ought to have some relationships with uh, with people providing psychological services, um, or maybe your primary care physician, or if you're in touch with other folks with MS, it's likely that one of them is going to know a mental health professional who has been helpful to someone, to them, or to someone they know. Uh, I wish I could say that there were more people available who uh, who specialize in uh, helping people live well with MS. We need more people and. I guess one of the ways to get more people is to put yourself out there and uh, and help develop some of them by um, by going to see them and helping them learn what the struggle to live well of MS is like. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rentel. And we did thank you so very much for tonight's presentation and a big thank you to all of you who joined us this evening for this webinar. Um, in conclusion, uh, we just wanted to let you know that Can You Multiple Sclerosis Guide to Lifestyle Empowerment Programs is a book that's been written um, by many of our CANDU MS program consultants, and it was edited by Pat Kennedy, a registered nurse and nurse practitioner who was our nurse educator and a longtime programs consultant um, on our CANDU MS staff. If you would like to see reviews or purchase a copy of the book online, please visit our website at www.mscandu.org. Uh, more information on the book is listed under the Programs tab. We would encourage you to keep joining us for our monthly webinars as we may be doing some giveaways and contests in the future. And our next webinar will be on Tuesday, March 12, 2013, at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern. The topic is Adaptive Equipment, How It Can Help You, and a special webinar on adaptive equipment that can make your life easier. Our presenters for that evening will be Kathy Sammartino and Julianne hansen Zlatev. So please join us from the conversation from your own home or from the office at no charge to you. You can register for the, for the webinars at the Can Do MS website, www.mscando.org, under the Programs tab. For those participating live tonight, once the presentation is over, you will see a survey appear on your computer screen. Please take a moment to complete that survey and help us continue to improve our webinars. Your feedback is very val valuable. You will also receive a copy of tonight's webinar slides via email. So we thank you so much for joining us and have a great night.